Welcome back to the Diet Doctor Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Brett Schur. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Jeremiah Eisenshank. Now, Jeremiah is a family medicine physician who has gone on to get board certified in obesity medicine as well, and he also is the chair of his hospitalist group in a rural Minnesota healthcare system. And he's got one of these amazing stories that we're hearing more and more of, of someone who had his own personal journey into learning about low carb, um, how low carb eating benefited him. And he's, I'll let him tell you all the details of his story because it's, it's a great story. Um, but then how he could translate that to his patients um, and how he can help educate other physicians and clinicians. And we also talk about sort of the specifics of doing this in a rural setting. We talk about the importance of having a connection to where food comes from, because that can be such a powerful tool, a teaching tool and learning tool for people that is really unfortunately absent in so many situations. Uh, but it's it's a wonderful journey that I think I think you're going to enjoy hearing and hearing his sort of tips about um, what this can mean both for us as individuals or if you're a clinician, what it can mean for your patients, what it can mean for your medical practice. So I hope you enjoy this interview uh, with Dr. Jeremiah Eisenshank. Dr. Jeremiah Eisenshank, welcome to the Diet Doctor podcast. Hey, Brett. Grateful to have this opportunity to share my personal and professional low-carb journey. Yeah, and it's quite the journey. I mean, I'm really excited to get into the details of your journey and how you got to where you are today. But most importantly, I want to start with who you are right now. And then after that, maybe we can go back and sort of unpack your journey and the lessons you learned and, and what our viewers can learn from that. But give us an idea of who you are today, um, personally and in your medical practice. Yeah, so I'm a family physician by training. Uh, I live and work in beautiful rural Minnesota. <laughs> Uh, I have a pretty unique scope in the sense that I have a primary care family medicine panel, uh, obesity medicine practice, uh, and then I'm also the chair of our inpatient hospitalist team. So I wear lots of hats, and I think this has kind of uniquely suited me to see the whole spectrum of, you know, acute and chronic manifestations of insulin resistance, things we'll talk about more today. When I'm not working, I'm uh, married to my beautiful and lovely wife, Ashley, uh, two girls, Avery and, and Quinn. We live in the woods and, and live a very simple and balanced life. Enjoy having time outdoors, um, love hiking and paddleboarding. Uh, I try to live the things that I preach to my patients, you know, when it comes to the foundations of lifestyle, you know, healthy, real food, low carb diet, getting optimal sleep, you know, exercising for joy and purpose, and then managing stress and, and coping with all the things that are thrown at us. Yeah, it's, it's great to, to lead by example. I think that's so important and unfortunately not as common as we would like it to be. But, but I want to touch on what you said. So you have an outpatient family medicine practice and you're chair of the hospitalist. Now, that's pretty rare because usually people are either a hospitalist or an outpatient doctor. At least that's what it seems like in today's society. So you really do have a, an interesting intersection of both worlds, which is pretty unique, don't you? Yeah, certainly. You know, when I was doing my family medicine training, that broad scope just exposed me to so many things. And as I was looking at my future practice options, I knew I, that I didn't want to deliver babies anymore, but I couldn't decide on, you know, hospital medicine or outpatient medicine. So thankfully my opportunity here uh, allowed me to kind of mold and create my own practice model. And uh, that's worked out great for me for the last five years. Yeah. And you, you got extra um, certification from um, the obesity medicine or the American board of obesity medicine. So you also specialize specifically in obesity medicine. And is that something you started out wanting to do, or is that something you sort of evolved into throughout your, your journey here? Yeah, great question. If you had told me that I'd be doing that, you know, spectrum of my practice five years ago, I would just shake my head in disbelief. I had really no knowledge or interest of obesity medicine coming out of training. I think like so many docs and it, yeah. it took, as we'll get into in a little bit, you know, my own personal health challenges and realizing an alternative pathway to, you know, caring for myself that then I just had to dive into deeper and ultimately share with my patients. Uh, and then later through a spectrum of courses, conferences and mentors, you know, the obesity medicine uh, pathway. And uh, that's kind of taken me to where I'm at now, which is, you know, managing our, our busy outpatient practice. Yeah. And, and you said you have a, a unique um, sort of insight into the spectrum of metabolic diseases. So so tell us what you see as the, the main metabolic diseases that face most people and, and how your position of seeing them in both inpatient and outpatient really helps you care for these metabolic diseases. Right. So, I mean, I see the whole, full gamut, you know, on the outpatient side, it's, it's chronic, well, 
as most people think of chronic, you know, disease states, diabetes type two, sleep apnea, uh, uh, fatty liver, you know, as we're trained in obesity medicine, kind of that subcomponent of, you know, fat mass diseases, and then, you know, uh, sick adiposity or metabolic dysregulation, that whole spectrum. In the inpatient side, you know, I have a window into the, you know, acute manifestations of these states. And I think what I've learned throughout my training, I oftentimes think of Dr. Hallberg's um, reference, you know, as it pertains to insulin resistance and having that, you know, trunk of the tree being the, the common pathway, you know, the, the, the shared grounds for all these chronic disease states. And I think that's, you know, suited me to kind of see these um, conditions in the inpatient side from a different lens that isn't just more medications and kind of putting the holes in the, in the dam, if you will, but trying to just work back with folks and get to the root cause, giving them a sense of hope and, and also saying, you know, I, I can help you with this. I'll see you in my clinic next week. Um, and I just think that's a, something that I'm very appreciative of. Yeah. Yeah. Now, so it's hard nowadays to talk about metabolic disease and not also talk about the impact of COVID or the coronavirus infection because we're in the middle of this pandemic still and it's been one of the driving forces for inpatient mortality and severity of disease. Now, you're in a rural setting in Minnesota, so it seems like a lot of the uh, the problems with COVID has been centered around the more densely populated areas. So how are things where you are, and especially since you have the the inpatient experience, is it something you're seeing much of? Yeah, good question. You know, we haven't thankfully seen the surge of um, acuity and, you know, uh, patient volume that we thought we would based on earlier models. So I'm grateful every day that as I enter this building, it's another day where we can just plan and prepare and collaborate for what might be to come. That being said, we've had our share of hospitalized patients with COVID. And if they haven't been elderly, they've been of middle age and, you know, not metabolically healthy. Um, uh, so again, if for those that have survived, I've tried to reach out to them and, and say, you know, this this infectious state that you've found yourself in is largely rooted in, in your underlying health conditions. And we've got you through this one, but this isn't to say there's more to come. So let's, again, try to work with this. Let's collaborate with your doc uh, in, in the clinic and myself and um, try to see this as an opportunity to learn and, um, you know, undo some of those maybe food, food habits that are detrimental. Right. Right. I think that's important. That's a good perspective. And again, unique for you that you can see them in the hospital and in the outpatient. And uh, I mean, gosh, if there's a silver lining to coronavirus, it's the attention it's brought to the need for metabolic health. Um, and so hope we're talking about it more. I mean, people probably haven't used the, the term pre-existing conditions and metabolic health as much as they have in the past six months. Uh, so hopefully that is a silver lining. But, but this philosophy you have about the way to treat metabolic disease and prioritize metabolic disease and treat obesity is relatively new. It's not something that you came out of training thinking. So tell us a little bit about sort of that transition. Yeah, certainly. So it's, um, you know, it, as I mentioned earlier, it took me doing what I thought was the right thing, you know, eating as the food pyramid dictates, as our guidelines tell us to, as even an obesity expert I, I heard you know, speak at the Mayo Clinic a decade ago, you know, a diet rich in whole grains and, you know, vegetables, of course, but also fruits and kind of being, you know, not fearful, but, you know, cautious of the saturated fats. And I found myself, you know, through med school and residency, 40 pounds heavier than I was in college and struggling with things like reflux, um, eczema, mood changes, uh, sleep disruption. Uh, a good friend of mine uh, asked me to run a marathon uh, the, the fall of, sorry, the spring of 2016. And, and I, you know, uh, I trained, I ran on the trails nearby every day, putting in almost 400 miles, which is like the distance from St. Paul to Chicago. Meanwhile, I was carb loading. I was doing what I thought was right. And, um, you know, fast forward, I completed the marathon. It was a, an epic experience to see my wife and daughter at the finish line and do it with my best friend. I ended up losing about seven pounds to that process. And I sort of one night puzzled, thought to myself, geez, I mean, if, if I, you know, in my early 30s, who's, who's put in this amount of time, have done this and found myself to be in maybe a mild improvement in my health, how, how is it that my patients or those that are struggling with other barriers to improving their health can do this? And, you know, uh, I thought back to a lecture I heard the, the spring before one of my mentors, Dr. Steve Park, um, had talked about, you know, insulin resistance and carbohydrates and um, kind of in a way that I'd never heard before. And um, by way of me connecting to Diet Doctor and kind of synthesizing these two messages together, I thought, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try this myself. And, uh, you know, from October of 2016 into the spring of 2017, I 
you know, followed a ketogenic diet, found myself fasting naturally. And, and wouldn't you know, without any exercise beyond just the gentle snowshoe or shooting some hoops at open gym, I lost 25 pounds. And um, it was that spring of 2017 that it really, a light bulb, you know, went off. And I thought, I can't you know, withhold this uh, powerful tool from, from my patients. And that was where my primary care panel was kind of my first grounds to counsel, educate, and support my patients. And it's just really blossomed from there. Yeah. So while you were going through the the carb loading and the the eating the high grain diet, uh, did you notice any any changes in your metabolic health as well? Yeah. You know, interesting you ask. I didn't, and I should have done some baseline metabolic work. You know, that fall, Brad. I did have some done in, in med school, so a few years prior. And you know, my my fasting glucose was higher than it should be. Um, triglycerides are elevated. I didn't get an A one C or a fasting insulin. But, you know, at that 30 to 40 pound amount of weight gain and with my other manifestations of just inflammation, I, I'm sure it wasn't metabolically healthy. Yeah. Yeah. And then what changes did you see when you switched your, your diet to where you are now? Yeah. You know, right away, the cravings and hunger faded. I found myself like a lot of us, you know, just eating later in the day for the first time and not thinking about it. I did get some lab work uh, six months in and found that yeah, my triglyceride to HDL ratio was 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 great. Um Fasting insulin was about four, A1C normal. Um, yeah, it really just kind of fit the picture of what I now see almost every day, which is just that pattern of improvements across the board. I also yeah. just felt, you know, better rested. My mood was stable. Um, and I was sleeping better too. So then you go through this transformation personally, and now you can start to see this transformation in your patients. So what's your thought process when you think back of the way we've been trained, the way we've been taught, you know, the nutritional kind of common beliefs that are, that run through medicine, does it frustrate you? Does it anger you or does it inspire you to make change? Like where, where does that sit with you? Yeah, I, I think it's really all the above. You know, I think we were just taught through a different paradigm and that this other way of, of thinking, which is enlightened me in so many ways is one that I, I guess I don't judge other providers on. I just simply try to meet them where they are at, where they're at and educate them, whether it's, simple conversation, you know, conversations like this or sharing a journal article, or maybe it's a patient that we share together and I can follow up and say, you know, look what's different here. We've deprescribed medicines, the metabolic markers are improved, body composition's also there and the patient feels so much better. And uh, yeah, I think when, when people see this and know it so many times like you and I and feel it ourselves, it's really, it's impossible to, to not, you know, want to just educate and uh, do so with empathy and with listening and answer questions. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what about um, collaborating with your colleagues and sort of trying to educate others who may or may not really want to be educated in, in sort of a different way to do things? Uh, what's your experience there? Yeah. You know, it's um, that spring of 17 with some other interest in my community. I started a, what we termed then, you know, a low carb interest group. We just met across the hall here once a month, a variety of products and other specialties. And we just kind of talked out loud. Some of us called it a support group. Others, you know, called it kind of a, a literature or a journal club. And it just was kind of a piece by piece approach from then. And, and I think that's just spread. And I'm grateful to say, you know, now here in, in 2020, we've got a critical mass of interested providers from all kinds of specialties. Uh, actually, just today, Dr. Westman sent me a 25 of his pocket guides, his low carb management pocket guides. I don't know if you've seen those. But it's a great little reference. And it, it, didn't take me, you know, more than a minute to think of 25 providers in my community that I could easily share those with. In fact, yeah. um, so it's been, it's been a process and I think it's just those, again, those shared patients, those conversations over coffee and, and in the hallway that can kind of just spread knowledge. Yeah. 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 It's so encouraging for me to hear of, of people's transformations um, like you've had who can then go on and apply it not only to their patients, which is so powerful, but to other clinicians and other providers to help educate others. Because unfortunately, that's sort of the way we see this this movement, if you even want to call it that, spreading or just the the knowledge of what we've been taught. We've been sort of misled and that there is this whole other way of eating, eating low carb, eating higher fat that's perfectly safe and helpful. But it sort of kind of has to flow by osmosis a little bit um, because of the resistance. So it's encouraging to see someone like you out there doing it. Um, but another thing that, that I find so interesting about your story, and we've been you know communicating offline before this, so I know a little bit of, about you, that you grew up on a farm, which is part of what I find, I wish more people did, because, because then people have a connection to what food is, 
where food comes from, what real food is. And it seems like people who grew up on a farm kind of know how to eat better than most people. But my assessment for you, and I want you to tell me if this is true or not, is that maybe you had that experience, but then when you got into you know medical school and residency and sort of learned how to eat correctly, in the air quotes, that maybe that undid some of that knowledge, or am I just projecting my own thought process? Or is that, would you say you went through that, that pattern a little bit? Yeah, I think you're spot on. You know, I think the closer anyone, the closer the relationship anyone can have to the source of their foods, whether it's veggies or animal protein, I mean, the healthier and better it's going to be for us, the, you know, omnivore consumer. So yeah, as a kid, I was the oldest of four in rural Minnesota, helping my parents on a regular basis, you know, picking eggs, helping butcher animals and plant the garden. And, you know, the foods we had every night were foods we, we've grown, other than maybe a, uh, an occasional condiment. Everything on the table and still to this day for my parents is exactly what comes from their land. So, you know, as I think a lot of us go into high school, college, and then graduate training, you kind of distance yourself. That relationship becomes fragmented and almost tertiary. You kind of forget what real food is. So, it, yeah, it's taken me to kind of go through this process myself to just appreciate, you know, where I came from and, and how powerful – not only just the quality of the food is, but just the act of, you know, cultivating it and nourishing it and appreciating it, you know, beyond just a, a nutrient source, um, you know, has been and can be for all of us. Yeah. Yeah. And, and on the one hand, if someone like you who grew up knowing that sort of lost it and or lost sight of it, wh- what do we expect from people who didn't even grow up like that? I mean, there's such a huge disconnect that it almost seems, it, it seems like such a big challenge. So, um, the way you're raising your kids now and the way you're living now, do you still have part of that connection to the land and to, and to the food? Yeah, we certainly try to. Uh, we've got a couple acres in the woods, uh, three chickens and uh, a growing garden. Still try to help my parents out on their beef and uh, sheep farm, both of which are grass fed. Um, so yeah, you know, we try to, and, and uh, I think, yeah, just trying to show our children and not just my children, but all of our children that, you know, this, this way, this, 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 concept that we've developed about our relationship with food is so distant and dysfunctional that the closer we can get back to it to play a role in its in its you know um development and, and growth and then you know consume it with with dignity and appreciation the better and i think that's yeah it's not easy but i think it just takes crucial conversations that share knowledge and kind of replace willpower or a sense of hopelessness with kind of here's a direction you know here's here's the best time to start is now and here are just some pointers that we can do to help people reestablish that, whether locally or, you know, um, in their grocery stores. Yeah. So when, when you're, when you're providing for your family with mostly things that you've grown and you've provided, but you're in an environment like Minnesota where the winters are not exactly conducive to growing a lot of things. Uh, so how does that work? Cause I think most people can't even imagine what that would be like unless you've done it. So tell us how, what the winters are like when you're, when you're self-sustaining on a farm. Yeah, certainly. No, I mean, there's uh, cold and windy, uh, <laughs> to say the least. And I think it gets back to, you know, a lot of people here still will, will can the vegetables and meats. You know, I think vacuum freezers are kind of the next generation of canning and those are a, a phenomenal investment and can keep meats tasting and veggies, you know, fresh without freezer burn. Um, you know, I think getting, it is more difficult to source those fresh local products, but, um, you know, I think that is where if you want to eat this way and sustain yourself, it does require you to be, um, you know, shopping mindfully, you know, ideally you know, real foods that are optimally organic as we know, but not necessarily. So it is a bit more difficult, but it's not impossible. Yeah. And are these conversations you can also have with your patients? I mean, is this, because I mean, let's be honest, doctors office visits can be rushed and can't you not have a lot of time to, to spend, but you find that you can have these deeper conversations with your patients? Yeah, certainly. And I think once we get to this point, I know that so much has already been accomplished. If we're talking about how their chickens are doing, or which farmer they've gotten to know in the community, we've, we've come so far and I have those conversations frequently. Um, and, and so, yeah, it, it is a place and I, I, maybe to the previous me or the doc out there who's just learning this, it seems a bit odd, but yeah. um, if food is medicine, then I think that's where it starts. Right, right. And so the other part of your journey um, that I find so interesting is growing up on the farm and then eventually you went and hiked Mount Kilimanjaro which I think is awesome. I would love to do that someday. I'm sure that was an amazing experience. But what you did next is even better. After hiking Mount Kilimanjaro, then you went to work with the Maasai, uh, sort of the native people there, the hunter-gatherer tribe. Uh, so tell us what that experience was like, what you were doing there, and, and then I'll have some more questions about that. 
Yeah, it was a medical school mission trip between my first and second year um, with a group of other med students from around the, the country. We were, you know, in, in East Africa for a couple months. Uh, the first couple of days or five days were the, the Kilimanjaro ascent. And with, with lots of help and some altitude sickness, I didn't make it to the summit. Uh, and thankfully back down safely. Um, interestingly, eating lots of, you know, grains and granola bars. And if my Gatorade didn't freeze, my Gatorade itself. And then over the next few weeks, we went to some of the rural Maasai communities in, in that part of Tanzania. And we were just doing some basic health inventories, questionnaires on families, helping with a free clinic. And, you know, I was amazed to see how many of, of the people in that population were lean and they're aging well without, you know, abdominal obesity and uh, the things that we see so commonly. Certainly they had disease concerns, largely they're related to, you know, infections, um, sometimes trauma and just the day-to-day -day wear and tear that comes with being a rural farmer in Tanzania. But I was surprised that, that yeah, the general well-being of this culture seemed to be distinctly different from what I was used to, you know, back in the States. Yeah, did you sort of take note, like, okay, this is what people look like here. These are the medical problems they're seeing. And back home, people look very different. They're not sticks, they're apples, and they're having this completely different set of metabolic problems. As a first-year medical student, so you're still sort of early in the game, but was it enough to sort of make that imprint and say, huh, I wonder what's different here? Yeah, it was. You know, the first thing I thought of when I got home was I just looked at photos of like my grandparents and great grandparents and people from, you know, the first half of the 20th century and how generally those folks, if they were farmers or even working in factories, they kind of fit that same phenotype. And yeah, it did strike me that, wow, we've sure taken a different path here starting yeah. three, four decades ago. It wasn't, however, enough to really change my, you know, dietary choices as a med student and residents, you know, worrying about tests and staying up late at night, I would still drift to the carbs. And so it took my journey later to gain that weight and run the marathon to realize, you know, I, I've got to get to the root cause here and it's food. Yeah. So what did you think about the, the food culture and what they were eating for the Maasai, you know, the, the drinking cow's blood and cow's milk and, and foraging and, um, certainly not a low fat diet. Um, but what, did that register too? Is like, wow, this is crazy what these people are doing. How are they healthy while doing this? Or what was your thought process there? I, yeah, it was it was definitely a bit hard to absorb and understand, much less just to, to try some of those things. I didn't, you know, drink blood, but enjoyed <laughs> some some meals with them in the traditional sense. And yeah, I mean, it was just, you know, I think just the absence of grocery stores and gyms and just packages of the things that we just are so used to every day. I remember the, being there for a few weeks and the one thing I wanted was a bag full of Pringles, you know, or <laughs> Pringles, and then I'd spend time with them and realize there's no such thing. And yeah. so, yeah, it was a bit odd, but looking back at it now, I mean, it's, it's our real human ancestral diets and it, it works for them. They don't have a large prevalence of chronic inflammatory conditions. And certainly we've taken the opposite approach and we know what that's gotten us into. Yeah. So here you say to, to climb Tan uh, Mount Tanzania, you had your granola bars and your Gatorade, but somehow here were these Maasai warriors with, with no granola bars, no Gatorade, no snack food, active all day long, probably burning just as many calories per day as you did <laughs> hiking Tanzania, and yet they did it on just what was provided by the land. So, it, sounds, it sounds like impossible based on our current day society, but it's not. You were there. You saw it. You lived it. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? Yeah, it sure was a memorable experience. Yeah. Yeah, all right. But then even that wasn't enough to to make an impact for you to change your own life. It's sort of like, that's the way they live. This is the way we live, like completely different. But then through this process of training for the marathon, putting in mile after mile after mile on eating these carbohydrates, car, uh, carbo loading as you went through and, and still not seeing the improvements that you thought you would. It seems like that was the turning point for you that really hit home. Yeah, that totally was it. You know, I recall starting to run the spring of 17 in my double XL Lululemon running gear, still tight in my abdomen and struggling later with, <laughs> with overuse injuries and feeling frustrated, like, you know, spending time with chiropractors and therapists, uh, physical therapists more than I ever did before in my life thinking, well, what am I doing this for? Is this worth it? If I can't lose weight doing this, you know, how do I expect my patients to? And I thought yeah. so commonly of the uh, patients I saw in residency who would come back to see me time and time again, and I would just kind of keep giving them the same message of you got to cut your calories more and just exercise more, you know, exercise more. And here I am trying to do that myself. And, you know, I just, it was kind of a re revelation that this didn't work for me. 
I'm a physician. I've got the training and knowledge. I'm supposed to be the expert here. And uh, it just certainly, if I can't succeed in this pathway by way of following our, our guidance on optimizing health, then who can? Yeah. Yeah. Now, so now that you've had this transformation, is it to the point where you put everybody you see on a ketogenic diet or you think it's the diet right for everybody? Like, how do you, how do you approach that? Yeah. I mean, I think the analogy of when you've got a pretty powerful hammer, everything can look like a nail is quite, quite true. But I, I do have to, you know, I always ask myself, you know, in this era of trying to become from kind of a cookie cutter doc or just writing prescriptions that generally might work to trying to give a very personalized approach, understanding people's stories and meeting them where they're at, both emotionally, mentally, and metabolically. I do try to, you know, make, sh make sure that the message I'm giving the, the prescription and that I'm writing, you know, for food fits their needs. So I think generally when it comes to insulin resistance and the sequela metabolic disease that we see, you know, cutting carbs can, for the most part, in only improve things. Um, there are certain cases uh, where I'm a bit, bit more liberal on my recommendation, but it, it just kind of depends. Yeah. And so what are some of the barriers that you're seeing in your patients that are maybe keeping them from succeeding? And then the second part of that question is how do you help them overcome those barriers? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is uh, people who've tried so many things before and maybe transient lost weight and then regained it after a life stressor. They just kind of come with a sense of frustration and, and even hopelessness. And so, I, you know, I try to uh, hear their story and then give them a the sense of hope, saying that, you've uh, done lots of things and some of them have worked, but you're here seeing me today. It takes a lot of courage and vulnerability to do that. So I'm going to be your coach and I'm going to give you hope and we're going to do this together. And, uh, and this isn't going to be easy. It does take, you know, thinking about food in a different way, but over time with, you know, intrinsic goals and long-term views on what they're trying to accomplish. You know, I've, I've, I tend to see that those factors associate with success. Yeah. So, so I love that the words you just said, I'm going to be your coach, which is, let's be honest, kind of rare for maybe for a physician to think of themselves in that role as a coach. Um, but coaching is different than doctoring, so to speak. So do you feel like you have to have sort of two different hats and two different approaches? Because on the one hand, you have to manage medications and you know, that's a real thing too. And on the other hand, you have to coach and support. Do you see those as different as the same or how, how do you handle that? Yeah, I guess I probably kind of waver back and forth depending on the patient and the context of the conversation. I, I feel like my, you know, personal and professional experiences with motivational interviewing and, you know, uh, counseling and CBT kind of, maybe I wear the coach hat a little more there, but then certainly in the same sentence, I may be thinking about, you know, is it time to deescalate insulin? When's the last time we checked your triglycerides? You know, is it time for, you know, us to think about a sleep study? So it's just kind of a constant back and forth on that spectrum of physician you know, coach and counselor that you know, I am so grateful to wear every day. Yeah. And for your particular environment in, in, a, in a rural setting, um, do you find some people have challenges um, restricting certain foods um, and adding others? Or, you know, because, you know, we talk about we talk about low carb and the ways to eat low carb as if it's one thing for everybody and everybody's got the same experience. But it's clearly not. There are different pockets of the world and different pockets of our country um, all have different experiences. So what do you think is unique about a specific rural setting like yours, both challenges and opportunities? Right. Yeah. So, I mean, it's as simple as some of the uh, communities around here don't have, you know, broad, broadband Wi-Fi access. And so if uh, a spouse is staying home and an income uh, is an issue, you know, just even assuming somebody might have the internet to search diet doctor is sometimes a little much. Um, it's there all the way to understanding that, you know, in this kind of blue collar area where folks still work pretty intense jobs and um, long hours that, you know, the spouse may be struggling with an addiction issue, a mental health issue, or even a metabolic uh, issue, you know, challenge themselves. So it's, I almost feel like I'm trying to get both of those people in the room and, and understand what the motivators are and who's buying the groceries, where are you shopping, or, you know, who's cooking, how are we getting leftovers that are healthy and to work the next day, how about the kids? Um, I don't think those are necessarily unique to rural Minnesota. Um, I will say that people do have kind of a bit of a closer relationship with farms and maybe gardening than in an urban setting. So um, a lot, most of my patients have no problems, you know, uh, eating meats or growing their own veggies or having their you know, chickens. Um, so I think that's unique that a lot of people hunt and farm still. So that reestablish 
establishing that intimate relationship with their food source, you know, isn't a big hurdle in a lot of cases. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, that's a wonderful opportunity for a rural setting that the that the cities don't have um, when you're surrounded by skyscrapers or, or office buildings or little pop-up suburbs as opposed to farms and chickens, completely different opportunities. So I definitely appreciate that. And I like what you said about getting the spouse involved too, because it really is sort of a team effort and using leftovers at work. Cause I'd imagine if you're in a rural setting, if you go somewhere for work, chances are there aren't five or six healthy uh, food choices around that you can just run out to for lunch. So you probably have to eat whatever's available or what you bring with you. So that's a really important, um, a really important tip. Do you find people are a little resistant to that at first or do people take to it pretty easily? Yeah, I think at first, but as soon as they start eating this away and feeling good again, you know, a combination of the absence of cravings, control of hunger, mental clarity, then it's easy to convince them that, you know, not only is this more affordable and time efficient, but you're saving, you know, you're eating, you know, the right thing the next day as well. It's already there for you. Just pull it out of the fridge as opposed to the old way, which was, you know, stopping at the gas station and having, having whatever's inside at a lot of my male patients that you have to buy your gas and your food in two different buildings. <laughs> simple intervention can sometimes get them on that path to then understanding that, you know, leftovers are okay. Right. Right. Buying your gas and your food. It makes sense. You shouldn't buy food where you're buying gas. The two just kind of don't go together. Yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. Now, just to transition here for a second now, in your office practice, do you see from kids to adults in the whole spectrum? Yeah. Yeah. So as a family doc, I'm trained from, you know, birth all the way to the end of life. My outpatient practice is largely adolescents and adults. I do work with two phenomenal nurse practitioners, uh, Deb Steen and Rhoda Reese. And they do tend to see more of the kids and, and adolescents, but I'm fully capable of, yeah, essentially managing the whole spectrum, including families. We have plenty of uh, patients where we see the child, the parent, and even the grandparents. Um, and that's just a special window into that spectrum, that generational aspect of food, food relationships, and how we can kind of improve that whole food environment. Yeah. So what have you noticed in the course of being out in practice about the adolescents you've been seeing and, and, and metabolic disease in that specific population? Yeah, I mean, the, the intake of highly processed foods is no different than it was, you know, when I was a kid. And in fact, as we know, it's probably more substantial. Um, and so, each, I mean, each week we tend to get more consults of, of patients that are, you know, age 12 into their teens with incidental fatty liver or that little elevation in ALT. You know, we've, we've got type 2 diabetes diagnosis at that age as well, which I know a lot of our colleagues are seeing too. Um, so it is pretty profound and it just it just kind of, Re, re uh, kindles the desire that my team and I have every day to give everything we have, you know, to our patients and community, you know, and helping these these younger patients not become the heart attack at age 45 or the sleep apnea mm -hmm. in their 50s and helping them see another pathway while they can. Yeah, but that could be a really challenging age group because they don't they don't have the insight of what their future is going to look like and nor do they care, right? Nor should they really. They're teenagers. They're kind of living for the present, but um so what are some of the, uh, do you have certain tips or, or tricks that you can do to try and help the teenagers learn to eat in a healthier way? And of course, not necessarily going to a keto, all the way to a ketogenic diet, but just things they can get better and that the way they can learn more and improve more. Yeah. As, as I've uh, said before, you know, with any patient, particularly for kids and adolescents, it's meeting them where they're at, you know, using simple non-technical terms, using visuals, maybe even videos and analogies. And, and helping them understand food as more than just something that we put in our mouth, but as messengers or inputs that impact hormones that then kind of dictate so many other things. And again, with the parents' help, with close follow-up and accountability, we've had a lot of success in terms of you know, transforming our young patients' lives and putting them on a different path. Yeah, and I think it really speaks to the, the true like old school family medicine doc in a, in a rural community who sees the entire family. You know, not the pediatrician seeing this patient, the other uh, one doctor seeing the the mom, one doctor seeing the dad, but one doctor seeing the whole family seems like it, it can have that type of impact because, like you mentioned, how is it being modeled at home? And asking the kid to change without asking the parents to change doesn't seem like it's a very successful uh, intervention. So, um, I guess you you purposely sort of capitalize on that relationship, don't you? Yeah, it certainly is a lot of time and energy investment up front. I mean, those can be long visits with lots of messaging back and forth and follow up. But what we tend to see commonly months into this is not only does that patient, whether it's a young adult or, a, or an older patient, lose weight 
but then the spouse is down 20 pounds and my cousin visited and they started changing things and they've sent a photo of themselves, you know, in a swimsuit this summer on the lake that they wouldn't have ever sent before. So the, the downstream effect can really be substantial. And I think just makes it all that much more worth it. Yeah. Yeah. That's impressive to be able to touch that many people. Um, so well now, and we spent a lot of time talking about nutrition because obviously nutrition is so important when it comes to metabolic health and, and to weight. But what are the other factors that you talk about with your patients and and how do you help them start to adopt these if they're sort of foreign concepts to them? Yeah. So, you know, in that first visit and certainly every subsequent visit, we talk a lot about food and real foods, those that are low in carb and rich in healthy nutrients, proteins and, and fats. But we also, in our questionnaire and at every visit thereafter, talk about sleep optimization, both duration and quality. Uh, and then, you know, I think so important and, and, and missed, at least on my behalf in residency and my early training is getting on, you know, what's really bothering you? How have you been stuck lately? How are you managing those stressful moments or those stressful days? Previously, you would have snacked, or maybe you still are. How are you coping? And, you know, as we tell people, people are patients to, to eat less sugar. Sometimes I feel like we're taking away their best friend, this cheap, accessible thing that's super addicting that they cope with. And I previously did so often. So right away, trying to help them understand that you can make other friends. And for some people that's reading, going for a walk, uh, talking to a friend, um, developing a new hobby, something else that engages you, gives you joy and, and you know, releases dopamine. That's going to be your key to interchange that long term to have success. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Is that something you experienced personally when you started to make the transition too? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I began, you know, journaling more. And I, I love to love to write, um, hiking more often, doing more projects outside. Um, yeah, I, I just had to realize that myself. Um, I don't run as much anymore just because I found it to be hard in the joints. But, you know, I really don't have to to feel good. And that's that's the beauty of all this. Yeah, sort of the sort of unfair, though. Like if you if you would have known now, or if you would have known then when you were training for the marathon, what you know now, you could have had a completely different experience. And that, is that frustrate? That frustrates me. I'm totally projecting on you now, but does that, does that, does that frustrate you? Yeah, in a way it does. Um, it's one of those things, like if you could do it all over again, I, I, I don't know, I, I guess in a way I, I probably wouldn't pick a different path. Like certainly it was difficult, but it's, you know, enlightened me and transformed me in so many ways. It's funny, my, my best friend, Dr. Ryan Crushell, who asked me to run that marathon, in that same question, he said, either we can go to Hawaii tomorrow and just go on a quick vacation or you're running the marathon. So <laughs> I've often wondered, what if I just said, let's go to Hawaii? What would my life be like? What would my, you know, my patients' lives be like? And what would have been missed? And so, yeah, it was, it was totally worth it. <laughs> That's a great sort of existential question, what, how things would have changed. And what about him? Is it, is, is, did has your transformation rubbed off on on him your friend who's also a physician and have you had that effect on him yeah we've talked about it you know some since then he still does a lot more uh, endurance sports than i i think he's been more mindful of his food choices uh, but for him and his wife who's also a physician there it was kind of unique in that it's i think that this form of practicing medicine is is also affecting their community i, I started the first low carb conference in minnesota in, the, in may of 2018 and in the spring of 19, a couple of their dietitians actually joined us at the conference. And again, just to have engaged and curious dietitians wondering about this stuff from a different community by connection of my friends was pretty powerful. Yeah. It's, it's just such an amazing journey that you've been on first, a personal journey, then a journey with your patients, then a journey with your colleagues. And now as the head of running the hospitalist group and now creating educational opportunities for other clinicians. I mean, you've had such the wonderful stair step and it seems like you just keep going and keep going. So what, what's next in this journey? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Brett. I'm not really sure. I keep, you know, waking up and being grateful for every day. Uh, I often think about, you know, the Japanese concept of your ikigai or your purpose or calling in life. And, you know, that for those who don't know it is, doing something you love, positively impacting others, doing it with a sense of mastery and, you know, being compensated appropriately. And I think that that's just something I'm, that I'm so grateful to do. I do have a, a hope and desire in the future to translate some of my, you know, knowledge directly into physicians and healthcare providers who are struggling with their metabolic and mental health, both pre and now post COVID. I get a, a lot of joy out of connecting with my colleagues here. And, and maybe that's kind of 
a, a next level thing I'll do more in the future. Yeah. By the way, that was such like a, a terrible American way to ask that question as if what you're doing isn't already enough, that you have to do more, that there has to be a next step, right? That assumption like, no, of course not. It's okay to stop where you're at. You know, it's okay to be who we are and not have to strive for more all the time. But that was, uh, I guess that shows my biases a little bit too clearly there. But anyway, <laughs> um, so so it sounds like, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but is there hope? You know, with with everything that we've seen about the metabolic dysfunction, about the crises we're we're facing in metabolic disease, and how COVID has brought that to the forefront, is there hope? Can we change this for the mass population? Yeah, I, I certainly think there is. I, I mean, that's what carries me forward into every day, and and inspires me. And and I think it's just this um, this multi level approach of you know uh, platforms or institutions like Diet Doctor reaching a broad swath of people around the world, um, people like me and my community, uh, and the combination of the two, I think will coalesce to a point where, you know, there'll be some overlap and you'll come into communities like ours where it's, it's now kind of the norm to think about medicine in this way, to think about root causes and food as medicine and insulin resistance. And if we can do it here in rural Minnesota, I think it can be done in lots of other places. Yeah. Do you think it's maybe easier in in the rural setting though than than other places, or just happen to be that way? I think it might be. I mean, I I know all my colleagues by name. I see them face to face. That isn't the case if you're in a multi specialty group. You know, using yeah. Epic for all your communication. Um, we socialize a lot together, and I see my patients with regularity in the grocery store. So not <laughs> only are they watching what I'm buying. Um, but I'm also kind of got an eye on how things are going on their standpoint too, without judgment, but just kind of curiosity there. And then I think, like I said before, that people in rural uh, areas still have that close relationship with their food sources. Um, I think that's a positive as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and running into patients at the grocery store can be an interesting experience for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So like when, when my kids see like their teachers out in the community, they're shocked that their teachers actually like exist outside of school. I wonder if patients feel the same way about their doctors. Like, Oh wow. My doctor's at the grocery store. Totally. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for spending the time with me today and sharing your incredible journey with our listeners. Um, are there any last words of wisdom for the listeners? And then of course, if they want to find you or read more about you, um, where can they do that? Yeah, sure. So I'll end with, you know, um, a quote from Brene Brown, who I admire so much. And I think it just gets, it speaks to my transition personally and then professionally. And it goes like this. I now see that owning our own story and loving ourselves through that process is the bravest thing we'll ever do. So I think for us as physicians, for us to truly have, you know, a meaningful impact that, that gets to the root of our patients and lasts with them throughout a lifetime, we've got to look within ourselves and maybe undo some of the biases or difficult habits that we've had for a long time. I had to do that. And a lot of my colleagues have in this area too. Um, so I think, I think that just uh, speaks uh, broadly to my, to my story. Um, yeah. What's next? Like I said, we've got a busy uh, inpatient uh, uh, group here, as well as my outpatient uh, obesity medicine practice that's getting busier and busier. Um, I don't have social media by choice. I uh, tend to think that it, prohibits me from living a, a simple, deliberate, uh, intentional life and it helps with my own wellness, especially in these times of pandemics and elections. Um, if anybody wants to reach out to me or has questions, they can, they can connect with Brett and, and we can, we can uh, go at it from that end. So Yeah, great. Uh, awesome answers. I really enjoy your, your whole attitude and your approach um, and, and including and especially the whole social media part of it. It really speaks to who you are and what you prioritize uh, for yourself. I think that's wonderful. So, so thank you again. Could I have one more thing, Brett? Oh, please go ahead. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just sort of say this as well, that as we think about healthcare institutions from a broader sense, um, some of our listeners might be familiar with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, which talks about the triple aim or framework to optimize population health. It looks at three things, which is population health, cost and patient experience. And I think that our current standard of you know, managing diabetes, obesity, and the spectrum of these conditions, we know leads to more drugs, more costs, and also just kind of disillusioned and disheartened patients. And meanwhile, the epidemics continue to grow. So I think uh, this approach, the low-carb lifestyle medicine-centered approach, in my personal and professional experience, kind of 
undoes those things. If we look at those three factors, we deprescribe medicines, reduce costs, prevent diseases or reverse them. And I think most importantly, our patients live with a renewed sense of wellness and vitality that is really the only sustainable way out of these epidemics. Yeah, that's a great way to sum it up. Very good. Well, thank you so much again and uh, keep up the great work. I look forward to, to seeing more of you in the future. Yeah, grateful for the opportunity. All right, take care.